Hello and welcome to the Mindful Movement Podcast. I'm your host, Les Raymond. I want to thank you for tuning in for another episode. Today's episode is with a doctor I've been following for a few years now, and his work has had a big impact on me personally, especially when I was healing through some difficult times where my health had really left me due to a combination of, I guess, a bunch of insults. Some were related to living in a moldy environment. I was exposed to a tick bite carrying the Lyme bacteria. And my health really suffered. And it, it was, at the time, a very stressful time for me. But in hindsight, it's been really a great lesson where it showed me kind of where I needed to do more work in taking care of myself. And it was, it's been a really impactful journey with a lot of learning and then being able to parlay that learning to helping others. And that's definitely one of my passions. And here at the Mindful Movement, where we really try to empower people to play that bigger role in their own healing and their own sense of well-being, it's nice to have tools available to help guide you through that. And one of the tools I personally used was a book called Healthy Gut, Healthy You. And my guest today is the author of that book. And the thing that, I've read so many books about like health and nutrition. What I liked about Dr. Ruscio's book, Healthy Gut, Healthy You, is it provided an algorithm to kinda, it was like a do it yourself to improve your health. And I really like that style. I like having the power in my hands and I encourage other people to play that bigger role and and take on that power of their own healing. So it's, you know, sometimes you need help with that. And luckily there's people out there that have a gift of helping others and they are giving that away. Now we do in this conversation talk a little bit about a couple products that Dr. Ruscio uh, uh, puts out there. And I just want the audience to be clear that I do not get anything for that. Uh, There's no affiliate program. I just believe in some of his stuff and it's helped me personally. So I feel obligated to share that information. I have no financial interest involved with these products, but I am a believer. So if it does sound at moments like some kind of commercial where I'm blowing smoke, it's it's just these things are, I think, really well-made products that I personally have benefited benefited from, excuse me. And I think there's other people out there that could probably benefit also from them. So I thank you again for tuning in. I hope you enjoy the conversation. It is a little short. Dr. Ruscio had was a little short on time, so uh, it was maybe a little bit of rushed, but I think we covered some interesting topics. Hopefully one day I'll have him back on and we could take maybe a deeper dive on some of these topics. So I hope you enjoy the show and thanks again for tuning in. Welcome to the Mindful Movement Podcast. I'm your host, Les Raymond. I want to thank you all for joining me today for another episode. I am really excited about this episode. I have Dr. Michael Ruscio on. Dr. Michael Ruscio is a doctor of natural medicine. He's a doctor of chiropractic. He is the author of the Healthy Gut, Healthy You book, which is the only book I've ever really used as a gift. Um, (laughs) And he's also the host of one of my favorite podcasts, the Dr. Ruscio radio podcast, where they go over uh, a lot of things, health, mostly related to gut health, but just, um, you know, being that the gut health, as Dr. Ruscio points out, has such far reaching benefits to our general well-being. It's just such a great place to start when anytime you don't feel what you think you should feel, like 100% yourself, uh, Dr. Ruscio provides Uh, a place where you could go and kind of take a little bit greater control of your own health and being at the mindful movement, empowering people to take, play a bigger role in their own sense of well-being is really important. I'm really happy to have him here to maybe help guide some of our listeners. Dr. Ruscio, please say hello to the audience. Yeah. Hi, thank you so much for that warm intro. And it's, it's great to be here. Yeah. I am really grateful. Not for you just taking time out of your busy schedule today, but all the work that you've done, because it's really touched me personally, and it's helped me on my own journey, which maybe I'll share with the audience a little later. But maybe first you could tell us kind of how you 
how you got into the approach that you do when when trying to help patients find a, a better sense of well-being. Sure. Well, it, it was uh, a long and windy road, but I'll try to give you the, the short version. Uh, in, in college, I was pre-med and, and I, I thought I wanted to go into orthopedic surgery, not because I had any high degree of passion for it, but just my advisor said, well, you're kind of a, a burly guy and they typically do well as, as ortho surgeons. So I figured, sure, I want to help people. Um, didn't know exactly how advisors said go this route. And, and so that's the route that I went. At the same time, I was playing lacrosse in college and had a lot of energy and was used to kind of being a very happy, high energy guy. And over the course of a couple of months, I started having debilitating insomnia brain fog, fatigue, and depression. Totally unbeknownst to me in terms of why. And it's not like I was staying up late every night partying or eating like garbage. You know, I was meditating. I was chewing my food thoroughly. I was eating all organic. I was exercising. I was really into health and fitness. I was studying all the principles. Uh, it's so you know, I was doing more to be healthy on the one axis, but yet my well-being was crashing on the other. So I figured, well, this is, this is what doctors do. So I'll go see a few doctors. I'm sure they'll figure it out and, and I'll be fine. So I saw an endocrinologist, an internist, and a general practitioner, and they did their workups. And I think they truly were trying to help me. But they said, yeah, you know, you have a low body fat, good blood sugar, good blood pressure, good cholesterol. Uh, you're probably just stressed with school or, or overdoing it. Some of those platitudes that I'm sure people have heard from a doctor, which are well-intentioned, but fall kind of flat. Uh, and that was exactly what happened to me, which was, did you, did you catch the part of the timeline where I was feeling great? And then I dropped off and I started feeling terrible, but yeah, they couldn't find anything. Uh, and so through some holistic nutrition circles, I was studying and I heard about functional medicine and there was, you know, th this was what all of the people in that community were, were seeing for their, their healthcare needs. So I saw a functional medicine doctor. He posed the idea that I had an intestinal parasite. I thought he was off his rocker crazy because I didn't have any gas or bloating or abdominal pain or vomiting or diarrhea. Um, turns out that gold standard analysis with a stool test found I had an amoeba and it was causing leaky gut and all this food reactive brain fog and inflammation and resultant insomnia and fatigue and depression. Uh, and it was really that experience that opened my eyes to, wow, these problems in the gut can really tear you down and they don't always manifest super overtly with all these digestive symptoms. So I went into the field of functional medicine, this kind of realm of alternative and natural medicine. And there was a lot of good there, but then there was a lot of heresy and dogma. And I would come into contact with people who on the one hand seemed so progressive and open-minded and interested in things that I liked as herbal medicine is one example, but then their narrative on diet was, well, everyone's got to be gluten-free and no one should be eating dairy. And it just seemed really extreme to me. Uh, and so I started kind of fact-checking some of those claims as I was a student and early in my career. And the more I fact-checked, the more I found it was kind of a coin toss 50-50, whether a certain opinion in the natural and alternative camp was true or actually maybe quite fallacious just based upon dogma and, and kind of parroting what was done five years ago and, and up through to the future. So we started fact checking a number of things and now uh, I'm quite skeptical of, of many things in the field. And I, I try to help people navigate, here are the things that can help you, here are the things that are more dogmatic and may actually damage you, which is relevant in the field of natural medicine. There are people who are clearly afraid of food and on way too many supplements and they run a bunch of lab tests that are not accurate, but make them think they have problems that they actually don't. And all this can be very antithetical to health and healing. So what I'm doing now is really trying to find that optimum model of being progressive and open-minded, but also circumspect and careful on the other so that we can offer people up what works without any of the dogma or placebo attached. Wow, that's a great summary. Yeah, I really love, you have a knack for like simplifying things to try to avoid some of those common rabbit holes that people fall into when they seek. I mean, it's very common for people to feel maybe like failed, like not like maybe the, I guess, allopathic care model has like let you down because there's something they just don't have the time or the tool set to help right. you with. 
But then when you go into functional medicine, it's, it's very easy, like you say, to get way carried away with tests. And yeah. I know I've, I went down that route and you could spend a lot of money on tests where it might not necessarily even change what your approach is, whatever, no matter what the test says. So you have to really question, is it even worth it? Why not just try something that you know can help? they at least potentially help. And then, you know, try to be objective. Did it help? And if it did, you know, you're on the right track. And if it didn't keep, uh, you know, keep trying something else, but there's something. So I mentioned the only book that I ever gave away, I read a lot of books and uh, I teach generally, usually like movement in a gym environment, small group training, personal training. And over the years, like you always wind up talking food because it, it is such a big lever that people have to interact with how they feel and how their progress is. But I've always found like I couldn't find the book that really was like the go to that I could give to almost anybody that was suboptimal health and they could have a tool to make progress. And some it wasn't like some people, they just want the pill. They don't even care why. So, but for anyone that's motivated to, to play a bigger role, it was such a powerful tool to be able to hand this book to somebody and say, you know, go just spend time. It's a really fast read. It's you've got a ton of information, but more importantly, it uses like a really simple approach to, you know, these are some general things that could create, problems and there's a really basic way that you could make an approach where you could kind of do it yourself and you don't have to be a doctor granted it's going to have limitations i'm sure but you could accomplish so much by self-experimenting if it has some bit of thoughtfulness and i felt like the way that you thoughtfully put together the strategies is very easy to digest and easy to implement um, because yes one, not just with the tests, but supplements. I think you already mentioned. I, um, I've definitely been guilty of that, where when you don't feel good, you kind of, you're at a point where you're like, I'll try anything. And you wind up trying everything. And sometimes you wind up trying everything at the same time. So then even if something works, you don't even know what did it. Or if something's not working, you don't know if it's interfering with other things that might be helping you. Sure. So it was, uh, it was very impactful to me. So uh, I appreciate you putting it out there. Um, and there's some tools too that you put out and it's interesting. Um, I do a bit of fasting myself and I love it, but um, you know, that's not for everybody. It seems even though you could make good progress when you don't feel good sometimes, but you have this product that you put together and I know it's not the only one on the market, but in my experience, it's definitely the best tasting one that allows you to get a lot of the benefits of fasting, but you get to eat and it's, um, it's an elemental, it's an elemental product. Could you explain to the audience what, what elemental heal is and why that could be beneficial for someone? Yeah. Yeah. An elemental diet is very similar to a morning smoothie. Many people have maybe using on a daily or weekly basis right now with a few key exceptions. Uh, the ingredients are all pre-digested and devoid of fiber and prebiotics. And this, this complete meal replacement in being uh, pre-digested and also hypoallergenic essentially delivers the fasting benefits digestively so you, you give the gut a chance to heal almost like the analogy I use in the book is taking time off of a sprained ankle. Your ankle could heal quite easily in most cases if it's a sprain, if you just take time off of it. But if you were running, let's say three miles every day, it would really prolong the healing time. Same thing kind of applies in the gut where if we can use this pre-digested formula that absorbs in the first couple feet of the small intestine and leaves the rest of the intestinal tract alone, then it can have some rest and go to work on healing. It's also been clinically documented to starve things like bacterial overgrowth and also reduce inflammation in inflammatory bowel disease cohorts. Uh, so this elemental diet is- so, Just to clarify, so you're yeah. basically, you get the nutrients you need. So it has like all the 
the basics, like the yeah, building it's blocks. Meal, of, yeah, it's a complete it's meal complete replacement. Meal. Yep. Okay. Uh, it's essentially a protein, carbohydrate, and fat pre-digested plus a multivitamin, uh, but there's not any prebiotics or fiber. And, and these are the things that for some people cause a problem and, and specifically using fiber and prebiotics as an example, it's kind of a double-edged sword with gut health while certainly going from a high sugar, low fiber standard American diet to increasing your fiber intake will help lots of people. Once you get to a more normative fiber intake, more fiber doesn't equate to better gut health. And this is one of the things that's really frustrating when you see these people out there who write books about, you know, um, the fiber fix or feed your bugs. It's all this like razzmatazz around, well, good bacteria in the gut equal a healthy gut. Therefore, feeding the good bacteria equals a healthy gut. And there's a big logical maybe. step there. Yeah, exactly. Maybe. Uh, the real travesty is that it seems that for people who have the most uh, imbalances in their digestive tract will probably be the more likely to flare from a really high intake of fiber and prebiotics. And this is where an elemental diet is very low in fiber and prebiotics, which starves bacteria and fungus. And by doing so, it allows the gut, it, it at least appears to kind of reset because if, if there's a bacterial overgrowth is one example, and then you feed the bacteria, you may actually exacerbate the problem. Uh, it's also possible that someone's eating healthy foods, but those healthy foods, perhaps due to an inflamed or leaky gut are triggering more inflammation because the intestinal lining isn't healthy enough to process them. So that's where the rest or taking time off the sprained ankle can allow you to heal the gut so the healthy foods are no longer triggering you, which is what I experienced. I would have a chicken breast and broccoli and then have brain fog. <laughs> it's like, yeah. why the heck are these healthy foods causing reactions? Well, if the gut's not healthy, even normal food can be a little bit noxious. And this is one of the main things that an elemental diet helps to correct. Yeah, I found the same thing. And it, uh, the listeners probably heard, you don't really uh, know much about me, but I got Lyme disease a few years ago antibiotics like wrecked me six months later i was like head to toe in a rash mm. and um you know the western model had like one tool like steroid like without right. the work your work and some other functional docs out there i'd probably still be on steroid because i just would have never figured out uh, any other process but it's interesting when it was at its worst, like I was really limited and I got in one of those food traps where, you know, you get a list of like eight foods and like, that's what you could handle. But then I, I realized over time and listening to you that I guess the healthier you are, the more foods you could handle. And now like I've opened up to things that I never thought I was going to be able to eat again. And some of them are like awesome, like cheese, you know, something that like, everybody loves but and to take away and you know i could never eat it and now that i've made enough progress not all cheese in any amount but like i can have some raw cheese and it even feels like it's good for me like i feel like i'm getting a, a positive outcome from something that used to be somewhat devastating just as right. i've kind of made progress and that tool the elemental heal is i guess one of those tools that's allowed me to you know, periodically move the needle a little bit, like take out chunks of healing where you get rest. And I think people don't realize that how much it is kind of like running on a sprained ankle, like just eating, even if you're eating something healthy, if your gut's not like a hundred percent healthy, like that's still a lot for to deal with. And, yeah. you know, it, it's like sometimes it just needs rest. So the inner wisdom of the body could kind of do its thing and work, work its magic. And where fasting provides that a lot of people, it's a little out of reach for them. Anything significant, anything more than like, you know, yeah. uh, 16, 18, 24 hours, maybe. So because you have to kind of condition yourself up to that. It's almost yeah. like running a marathon, doing a few days of a fast. It, it takes time to condition yourself up to that. Absolutely. And if you're also really inflamed, that can kind of zap your vitality, making it even harder to have the reserves to be able to do a prolonged fast. Yeah, it's a, it's a great point. Yeah, so it makes it uh, much easier. And 
I mean, I'd be, as much as I love fasting, I think I feel better on the elemental heel. I mean, I get that good feeling where there's like no bloating and you feel nice and light and springy and your inflammation's down, but you have all the energy because you're still getting nutrients. And uh, it's nice. I do have, uh, I guess, one formal complaint, though, and one <laughs> and I'm going to say one pro tip for the listeners out there. The complaint is I think you're out of chocolate right now. <laughs> and I do like the chocolate one a little bit better than a vanilla, um, but I like them both. And I do if you know, it's just a great tool. And listening to you, there's a lot of different ways. I've done it kind of hardcore where I've lived on it only for like several days. I've done it where I've kind of supplemented with it here and there. I've used it as like a post-workout shake before. It's a, I find it could, it could actually be a versatile tool. But the, the pro tip out there is you get chocolate and vanilla and you take three scoops of one and one scoop of the other. Hmm. And you get a slightly different like flavor profile and that's what I find myself great. It doesn't really matter which one, three vanilla, one chocolate, three chocolate, one vanilla. But that's, uh, I don't know, that's a glimpse into my weirdness of, you know, I, how I think about this stuff. And I'll, I'll play with stuff. I'm a big experimenter. So I've definitely experimented with that product. And it's great. And I like it because it's powerful. Like in your book, you talk about these very simple things and some of them are a little counterintuitive because a lot of times it is like taking away something that you've grown up thinking is health food like right. broccoli or um, and i like how you start with these really easy steps that are easy to do and you might get a positive outcome and then you you kind of you know you know where you're at and where to go from there but then you could also turn up the dial of intensity and say i'm you know if your will is up and you're like i'm willing to do something more um dramatic or you know take a, a stronger approach you have these powerful tools and it's just great to be able to have that uh or if you're ever like tra sometimes if i'm traveling and i've like i really don't know what i'm going to be able to access i don't want to be stuck with a restaurant that you know is filled with like inflammatory yeah. oils yeah like i could put some of that in a ziploc and mix it it would, don't, won't mix as well without the blender but it's still like you could do it and um it could kind of save you in a pinch also. It's a, it's a great tool. And so be careful flying with a bag full of powder. Yeah, <laughs> good point. <laughs> so why is it like, what is it about that, that, that you could, I find that the more I learn about health in general, everything seems to come back to the, to the gut and that so much takes place there. And yeah. why, like we hear that, the health of our gut could interact with all these other things like our systems, like our brain or our skin or our mood. You said you had like even really like what could be considered mental illness, uh, like anxiety and depression. Yeah. Why does the, the gut or intestines like GI tract, however you want to label it, why does it do that? Why does it have this far reaching effect? Well, th there's a few reasons why. Um, one, it, it's the, area where all of your nutrient absorption occurs. So if there's problems there, even if you're eating a healthy diet, but you have poor absorption, that could almost be considered akin to eating junk food, right? Because if you're not getting the nutrients out of healthy food, then that may be akin to eating unhealthy food. So chronically eating junk food, we, we could kind of say is similar to what happens with an unhealthy gut. It's a loose parallel, but just as an example. Uh, also, probably the, the primary reason is the small intestines is the most amino active organ in the entire body. And it's really likely that immune system tie-in that causes all these problems. This is something like food reactive brain fog is likely due to the immune component uh, and joint pain or skin reactions. A lot of this probably comes down to that very sensitive permeable membrane of the small intestine it has to let nutrients in, but keep bacteria and virus and, and other pathogens out. And that gateway is monitored by the immune system and inflammation is what's used to monitor that gate. So if that gate is faulty or leaky, then excess inflammation can be recruited to try to clean up that mess. But inflammation causes problems. You know, being overly inflamed is, is maybe one of the 21st century pandemics. Um, so. Yeah, you know, those factors, and then also in the Western environment, we're not really setting ourselves up for immune health. Uh, 
Um, well, I mean, depending on how you measure this, but on the one hand, as public health campaigns have reduced uh, infantile deaths and uh, parasites and other infectious diseases, we may have swung a little bit too far where now that we're so hygienic, the immune system isn't getting enough training. And this is why as infectious disease is going down, other graphs are showing autoimmune diseases going up. And so there is a trade-off there. It's not to say we want to swing all one to all the other, but we may be trading some of the infectious diseases for the autoimmune diseases. And a lot of that seems to come back to lack of exposure to dirt and germs early in life, which helps colonize the gut, which helps tone the immune system. So another kind of parallel back to the immune system. So for a number of reasons, the intestines may really be in need of some tender loving care, especially as, as we get older. Uh, and it, it may be the immune component of the intestines that is responsible for the gut brain, the gut joint, the gut skin, you know, the gut metabolism connection for how the gut affects all these different systems or symptoms. Do you, is, having said that, do you think that as an adult now, like we need ongoing stimulus for immune system to kind of keep that mechanism like is staying like now a lot of people obviously are not getting as much interaction with other people. Is that like a you like lose it or use it thing? Like I know if you don't go to the gym, you stop lifting weights, your muscles are going to get smaller. Right. I mean, is do you think the immune system depends on that ongoing as we, as we age? Good question. Um, to some extent, yes, but it seems to be most impactful in the first three years of life. That, that's when perhaps the majority of you know, immune development occurs. Uh, but in adulthood, um, it, it does seem that you need some ongoing exposure to microbes to keep your immune system having some of that exercise. There, you know, there are some nuances there. Um, Whereas, so as one example of a nuance, there is evidence showing that children that grow up on farms have less immune and inflammatory conditions later in life. Mm -hmm. But when adults who don't live on farms go and episodically visit the farms, that may actually flare allergies and it may have to do with consistency of the exposure. Oh, Where episodic exposure to stuff the immune system isn't used to seeing may make the immune system go, ah, what is this? But if it's ongoing, eventually the immune system may calibrate to that exposure. So, um, you know, the immune system is complicated and there's many factors that influence how it will work. And I, I also discussed this in Healthy Good Health You because we have to be careful not to say, well, exposure to dirt and animals is helpful for developing children, but it doesn't mean if you have very bad environmental allergies to just force yourself into an environment that's causing you to sneeze and have a runny nose and itchy skin. Uh, so, you know, we want to be aware of the general trends, but then also honor an individual's response and help us navigate what we do. Gotcha. Well, I still get out and try to get some dirt in me regularly, even though I can't bump up against people as easy. Yeah. And, you know, that's something else that you mentioned in the book, which is great because like what I've gone to a bunch of doctors over the years and none of them have ever said, like, go get in nature. Um, and it's, it's really like refreshing to hear, not just that advice, but it's listening to you for a while. It seems like you make a, a, a legitimate mindful attempt to like walk the walk. And, you know, it sounds like you're writing from your partly, even though you have all this like research that you back everything and you even kind of create a hierarchy of the quality of research, which I think is really nice to see. It kind of gives the reader an idea of like, is this research strong or average or yeah. it's, but it, it seems like you're really writing from your experiences too, not just like data driven uh, ideas. So, but that was really refreshing. Like, because now I know I try to get nature regularly and it is legitimate medicine. Yeah. I mean, and I, you know, I didn't hear that till I was in my 40s, even mm -hmm. though I've been through, you know, dozens of doctors over the years. Nobody's ever said go get in nature and everybody can relate to it. Like everybody knows that if you're walking down the beach, like something feels good. Yeah. Or absolutely. if you're uh, I think you mentioned like forest bathing, like. 
you you can't go for a walk in nature and have like a negative result unless you like twist your ankle on a root or rock or something. It's like you know you always feel better after. It's it's kind of like a no brainer, but nobody tells us. And when we get reliant on doctors because we don't know or we don't have time to research ourselves, you know, you miss out on these things that are really like the lowest hanging fruit. Like get some sunshine, you know, drink enough water, like the just the basics. So. It's nice that you touch on that and you give enough information where someone has context of why they're doing what they're doing, like the explanation of how the intestines work and leaky gut. But it's not a scientific, you know, you're not reading a textbook. It's very easy for the average person to get. So I, I definitely recommend folks to, to check it out. And if there's someone in your life that doesn't feel well, uh, it, it makes for a great gift, um, that book. So. <laughs> I do appreciate that. Yeah, maybe we could touch on some other things like that are common that people run into. Like you mentioned, you had like you had a gut that wasn't healthy, you had an amoeba in it, but it showed itself in all these differing ways. So if people maybe don't have 100% health and they don't know why like what are some common things that people run into that they might not associate that they can make progress on that symptom by taking an approach that prioritizes just this gi track and and coming from a framework of like how do i optim optimize this system yep I, I think the best way to handle this is really through a process of elimination and the reason why there is such a wide array of symptoms that can be caused by problems in the gut brain fog, fatigue, depression, insomnia, joint pain, skin lesions, atopic dermatitis, um, potentially problems with conversion of thyroid hormone. Uh, you know, there, there's a fairly wide array of issues that may actually be caused by a problem in the gut. So symptoms aren't the best barometer. I mean, sure, if someone has chronic diarrhea, there's almost for certain a gut problem present, but it's harder to connect the dots if you have fatigue and anxiety that there could be a gut problem causing it. Yet we do know in certain models, as one example, gluten sensitivity may manifest only neurologically and someone may not have any digestive symptoms and they solely have neurological symptoms. So this has been documented in, in more robust scientific trials. So how does one then determine if their digestive system is causing their symptoms? Well, first lay the foundation, which is get on a generally healthy diet to your earlier points, get some time in the sun, drink enough water, get some exercise, have some time in nature, have some enjoyment in your life and see what happens. If all your symptoms go away, then it was a lifestyle problem. But if there are still symptoms present, the most likely culprit, non-lifestyle related, is your digestive health. And that's when I'd go through the protocol laid out in Healthy Good Healthy You because it walks you through an algorithm to navigate the available therapeutics and to personalize them to your system. Because yes, the, the symptoms can be so broad that sometimes people just go with, well, I Google searched constipation, fatigue, and dry skin must be thyroid. And they, they go down that rabbit hole and sometimes they find a doctor who has a heretical perspective on thyroid issues. And we clean up these messes all the time in my clinic where someone's pursued a fictitious thyroid diagnosis. Their doctors miss the fact that digestive problems are three to 10 times more common than thyroid problems. But for some reason, when you punch certain symptoms in the internet, people are more likely to land on thyroid as the cause. Um, and that seems to be unfortunately leveraged by a system that is partially quick to diagnose fallaciously a thyroid problem. And I would really love to not see the literal one case per day in the clinic that we have to undiagnose an incorrect thyroid diagnosis, fix their gut, and then they're better in two to three months. Whereas they were being force fed levothyroxine armor and cytomel for a year um, before they actually Why is that? Out. Is that just driven by blood values? I mean, I, I know so many people in my life that take thyroid medicine. Why is thyroid such a common thing that either people have issues with or doctors 
assume they have issues with? Yeah. Uh, so certainly just, just to speak to the trend, there is a trend of overdiagnosis. This is something that has been published in Medscape. A uh, researcher, Lavadas at the University of Athens at Greece published a paper where they found that 60% of patients who they double checked were actually incorrectly diagnosed as hypothyroid. So this is something that has been legitimized by researchers who have fact checked this in, in controlled settings. Where it comes from, my thinking is there was a kernel of truth that was championed by the functional medicine movement, which was that autoimmunity and Hashimoto's underlies hypothyroidism, which was a, which was a good win because then we could correlate things like vitamin D supplementation and certain dietary changes to reducing those antibodies and potentially improving the prognosis of the individual. So that was true, but that kernel came ensconced in a bunch of misinformation. Uh, most of this stemming from, well, if here are the values that have been validated as high or low for your thyroid range. So this is what the science has shown to mean if you're above it, you're hypothyroid, and if you're below it, you're hyperthyroid, and this is all normal. Well, we in the functional medicine community disagree. We think you have to be in this range to be normal. And so if you're not in this range... For, for the listeners that are listening to this on the podcast, he's basically saying a, a narrower range. Yes, he's using sorry. His hands. Um, yeah, so, so there's a broader range that conventional medicine considers acceptable. And this is actually one area I think conventional medicine has this much more right than alternative medicine. Uh, in alternative medicine, they're trying to help people. So th 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 there's a virtuous impetus behind the recommendations of having that narrower range. But what ends up happening is people nitpick over downstream perturbations in the levels of thyroid hormone, none of which fit the diagnostic criteria for hypothyroid, but they may be suboptimal, missing the fact that the thyroid is not the cause. As an example, we know that inflammation can skew the way some thyroid hormones look. But guess what else? Healthy metabolic stressors, like going on a lower calorie diet for a short term or a lower carb diet for a short term, and seeing fat loss and energy gain also correlates with some of those same perturbations in thyroid hormone. Hmm. So what, what's happening is, we're looking at these minuscule perturbations of thyroid hormone, making a false proclamation that that diagnoses hypothyroid and giving people medication who don't need it. When we've done the research studies where we look at what happens in these people, the overwhelming trend shows that these subjects do not benefit from thyroid hormone. But for some reason, um, it seems to persist and it probably emanates from a undercurrent of good intentions combined with a misreading of the data and then a confirmation bias on the part of clinicians and providers. And what I mean by that specifically, and sorry if I'm being a little bit long-winded, right. Mary Sue goes to see her doctor. Her doctor tells her it's thyroid. She's happy because she now has a cause. She's given a drug that she doesn't need. She has an initial favorable placebo effect but then there's a follow-up drop-off, meaning at six months when the person's not feeling any better, they go see another doctor. That incorrect diagnosis isn't double-checked, so the medication stays on board, and then the other doctor goes to work on the actual cause of the problem. Now the person feels better, but doesn't realize their initial incorrect diagnosis was in fact incorrect. And we'll see these people in my office a year, two, three, four, five later, and now we routinely ask for the labs that diagnose them. And you would be shocked how many people are walking around with an incorrect thyroid diagnosis because they did not follow the simple diagnostic criteria. Don't stop medication on your own. Check with a doctor. I don't want to you know, lead people to think that they should just stop using their medication. But if you have any inkling that you've been misdiagnosed, meaning you saw a provider who was highly integrative, it's, um, sadly, that's the main tell you probably want to get a second opinion to make sure that's the case. Interesting. So, and the placebo effect, so you think a lot of that benefit they get initially, because they might feel better, you, th you think that is primarily placebo? Placebo effect um, in 
as a parallel example, in IBS trials that are randomized and blinded to, mini to minimize placebo, average at 45%. Oh, wow. There have also been studies that have taken people on, let's say, levothyrox in two groups of people that they you know, take all the people, they break them into two groups. The researchers blind them, meaning they give them back a bottle of pills that have nothing on the label. Half of the people get the same medicine they were taking before. The other half get a different medicine that now has, let's say, T4 plus T3. It's supposed to be something like armor or synthroid. At the first three months, they all report the same improvement in well-being. But then it drops off over time once the placebo effect wears off. So, yes. I didn't know that the placebo, I knew it was powerful. I didn't realize it could last so long. So that's interesting. So in, in that case, like somebody comes in, let's say they've been misdiagnosed a year or two before, is it hard to get them off? Do you just kind of go back to the same framework of let's just, you know, optimize this per person's GI system and see what happens. And then you're, you have your finger on the trigger ready to like wean off the the medication or? Well, the good news from that same paper by Lovatis is they did not find that the length of time someone was on hormone predicted whether they would successfully be able to come off or not. So that's really encouraging. If you're on the yeah. hormone for six months or six years, what really mattered was if your original diagnosis was correct or not, uh, or, or at least so it appears. Um, now, in terms of when is the best time clinically to do that, that's more up for interpretation. What I tend to do is focus on everything else that we can first, meaning if their diet isn't where it should be, if their gut seems to be inflamed, maybe we'll pair dietary changes with periodic use of elemental heal as an example, or the, the proper use of probiotics as another example, and get them to a point where they have little to no symptoms. And now we have a new, healthier baseline to then go through the withdrawal off the thyroid medication. That way, if someone does have any sort of symptomatic change, it's very apparent where it's coming from. So really all that's trying to do is just reduce the amount of variables changing at any one time, which is actually a fairly pivotal key, in my opinion, to successful um, you know, natural medicine healthcare is not changing so many things at once where you can't tell what's working and what's not. Gotcha. Well, that's interesting. So you, it seems like we have um, this opportunity where like kind of no matter what the problem is in a way that you could just take a step where you're, you're coming from a framework of how do we just get better generally um, and then see if like the symptoms improve. And then if you've done everything you can, maybe you could take deeper dives and that's where testing comes in. It maybe is more relevant when you've, you know, you've done the, the easy things first, but it seems like there's so many things that come from some level of like chronic inflammation somewhere along this GI system or like some imbalance of bugs that live in us, the microbiome, whatever. Like you mentioned, like when you had your symptoms, you had a amoeba that was in your intestine somewhere. I knew I got bit by a tick and I had some mold exposure and it, I mean, it, it was a whole mess. I mean, like, do I, I have this sense that people don't realize all the other things that like all the things that could potentially irritate or create an insult to this system that's core to all of our well-being. What are some other things that somebody might not be aware of that could be common insults that they might not be think of? Like, I remember I had, um, you know, the mercury fillings, mm -hmm. mercury and silver fillings, yeah. never thought anything of it. And then when I, you know, started getting tests and got my hair tested back when I had hair, it's hard for me to get a metals test now because <laughs> they require, they want you to have like at least half an inch of hair or something. So, um, but they like, sure enough, mercury and silver came up really high. And it was like, oh, these things in my mouth are not benign. These are like dangerous levels of mercury. And I could have easily gone a really long time without ever knowing that it was a problem. And a lot, you know, I know a lot of people walking around with those things still in their mouth. What are, what are some things that are common that will be that insult 
that somebody might not be aware of? Well, it's, yeah, um, surprisingly, there are some simpler things that people overlook. And, and in my experience, mold and metals are oftentimes gone after way prematurely while people are missing more important foundational factors. And I, I always try to look at people like a pyramid. You have the foundational layer, and then you have another layer, layer above that. And you know, as you go higher and higher up, you get to the apex. But if you go to an apex issue while overlooking a foundational issue, your pyramid's gonna fall over, right? You just don't have a good foundation underneath you. Um, so probiotics and using probiotics the right way is probably one of the most overlooked concepts that we'll see where someone will kind of haphazardly try one from the shelf of Whole Foods, one from a blog that they read, you know, one from something that popped up on their Facebook feed. Um, yet they don't have kind of a, an overarching guiding map for how to use probiotics, uh, which is actually a travesty in that people will come into our office and have to pay money to work with a doctor to only have them help them use this simple tool the right way. And then that may solve all of the chief complaints of the individual. Uh, so the appropriate use of probiotics would be one, and I'll tie that in with one dietary one, which would be the overconsumption of fiber and prebiotics. This is, this is more of a problem in probably the paleo community where there's certainly some evidence and, and some benefit that can be vectored by that diet, absolutely, where you try to eat more of a hunter-gatherer type diet. But it doesn't mean that if it was the right diet for hunter-gatherers, it's the right diet for those current day. And that this may have to do with the different immunodevelopment that we have now, and it makes some people's digestive systems and immune systems more sensitive to a high fiber and prebiotic intake. And those two things, when corrected together, meaning getting the right amount of fiber and prebiotic in someone's diet, combined with the appropriate use of probiotics, will wipe out many of the case who thought they had more of these kind of uh, apex pyramid issues like adrenal fatigue, metal toxicity, mold toxicity. There, there are times and instances where that's true, but that's probably the vast minority, whereas the other issues I'm describing are, are more so the vast majority. Hmm. Okay. Um, so again, yeah, it's not the same. The fiber thing's you know, interesting. We one, had one a, of those is right or wrong. It's just, it's just kind of like a sequencing. How do we sequence these so as we put the things that are the most probable first? And then through the process of elimination, we work up to the others. Yeah. The, the fiber I find interesting because that is something that I feel is like really commonly pushed. And some people really seem to do well with really as much fiber as they can. But there's definitely a huge population out there, it seems, that, that have a better outcome when they, when they have very low fiber, at least for some period of time. And I feel like that does not get conveyed well in like general health um, platforms. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's unfortunate because it's such a simple thing. Um, I mean, a lot of people eat fiber and they don't even like the thing. <laughs> like it's not a hard thing to, to cut out. We had um, recently on here, the carnivore doc, Dr. Paul Saladino. Sure. And, okay, you're familiar. And, um, and you know, he's a perfect example, like zero fiber. And there's a, a whole community of people that you can't argue they're they're thriving on zero or close to zero fiber. So if it was really necessary, like you wouldn't see large groups of people that could thrive so well with it. Um, that being said, I mean, I'm sure many people do fine with it. But I wonder also if it's if there's maybe not just the inherent nature of the food itself, but you know, we've been using chemicals for so long all over the world. Like maybe you can't really get clean broccoli or because who knows what's in the soil or in the water, they're watering sure. it. It could be like, it might be hard to really detail what the culprit is, but it seems like, like you mentioned, you had a parasite. I also had issues with parasites along the way. I, my guess is that when you go on like a broad spectrum antibiotics, this is just a theory, it wipes everything out so much that anything that's like opportunistic has room to grow maybe like, cause the bacteria 
not just has to be in balance. Well, maybe it has to be in balance, but like it, there's some policing, like it's doing some to- type of regulating or immunomodulating or something. And when you clear it out, anything that you might be able to handle if it's in a small dose relative to your overall like bacterial picture, maybe it gets to take advantage and kind of fill voids. And then it becomes more problematic because it's out of balance. But I remember dealing with that. And I mean, there was a doctor would look like, I felt like I was looked at like I was crazy for bringing (laughs) that up and it didn't seem right. But sure enough, like when I went on an anti-parasitic like protocol that was from like an integrative doc, you know, parasites came like it was obvious, like health parasites came out and health improved, but no test ever showed it. Like, I think you got lucky because you said you took a test and it showed a parasite. Well, and, and I, I should also clarify for people not, not to represent it as if ame- amoebas are actually quite, quite rare. Oh, uh, are they? You know, that, that, that was not something that most people will have. And I mean, running for, for many years, two tandem stool tests on pretty much every patient that I saw, you'd see a handful of amoebas in a year, if that, maybe one or two cases really. Okay. Um, so amoebas are quite rare. Uh, parasitic worms are also quite rare. What's more common is just subtle imbalances, like small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, where there's, there's just an overgrowth of the stuff that's normally there, um, or dysbiosis, which is just a imbalance in the community. Those things are more common. They're not as, um, viscerally jarring as a parasite you know, that'll really grab your attention <laughs> yeah, um, some people the, just can't even talk about i can't even talk to my father about them right He's like get so grossed out right exactly uh and i, I think people uh believe that parasites are more common than they are because it's so appealing uh i just want to be careful not to let people think that amoebas or parasites are common they're actually much less common but it seems to be these subtle perturbations in the community of bacteria and fungus in the gut combined with the immune system being malcalibrated that will lead to this chronic inflammation. Um, the, the reason why I say that, I just want to prevent people from spending the money from doing stool tests after stool tests after right. stool tests because you can blow a lot of money very quickly and get little to no answers from that. Yeah, I'm totally guilty of that. And I know I'm not alone with that. And I think it's just such a, one of the most important points that you make and uh, I applaud you for doing that because I'm, I'm sure, I mean, I would think that on some level there's a, another buck to make through testing, but um, you know, you, you could take steps. Like I know in the gym environment, it's a similar algorithm. Like people come in and something hurts and we could get, it's really easy to get like myopic on that and, and stare at this part. And it's yeah. kind of an illusion. Like we don't really move in parts, not, like nothing works in, in isolation like that. So we always just think, well, let's not aggravate it and let's work on being the highest functioning human organism we could be. So you just work on functionality, you get better, better at everything without doing anything that seems to aggravate it. And, you know, for a lot of people that don't feel well, you usually have some kind of barometer where if you aggravated, if you took something like that didn't go well, whether it was a food or supplement, you usually have some kind of signal. So there's some yeah. kind of feedback loop of like, that was a bad idea. Exactly. But you could always be coming back to, well, this next step I'm going to work on, you know, forward from here, what, what's a logical decision. And I think that the scaffolding that you provide in your book where people could kind of walk through that process is just um, really priceless. I applaud you for putting the work in to, to making it available. And um, it's, it's a very effective and there's something to be said about, you know, being able to take charge and not rely on no offense, people like you. Yeah, no, not to taken. make progress. That being said, uh, if someone, let's say they take these kind of low hanging fruit, fruit, like approaches, like they read a book, that's pretty easy. They, they get an idea of, uh, let me try this. This is worth trying. Maybe they make progress. Maybe they have some bumps along the way. And that's also common when you're healing. I know when you have a bad day, it's very easy to think like I'm getting worse. But what, yeah. sometimes if you frame the question of like, how am I compared to a month 
before or three months could give you kind of a bigger, a clear picture on how you're trending. Cause I know when you feel sick and you work hard to get better, it, it's unlikely that it's going to be perfectly linear. You'll have some ups and downs, yeah, good point. Um, but let's say they go th through that, they make progress, but then there's still something and they don't feel like they can get to where they can. If they want to take a more personalized approach, can people work with you or your office directly? Are you doing, you're in Austin now. Yep. Are you working through uh, remotely? Can people, or do people yeah, have to show up in Austin? No, we're, we, uh, right now we're exclusively telehealth because no one wants to come into the office and I can't say I blame them. Uh, so now we're completely telehealth. My clinic name is the Austin Center for Functional Medicine. People can find information at, at austinfm.com on that. And we're more than helping me or, or any of the doctors on our clinical team are more than happy to help people. And we're all kind of championing the same effective practical functional medicine model. Um, and and I, I should also mention that um, with, with the book, uh, I'll be at some of these things being low hanging fruit it's, it's really amazing how if you went and you saw a doctor, someone with a lot of credentialing, but they gave you the wrong information, if you got the right information from a book, that could actually help you recover your health. And, and we've seen a litany of people who've seen, and I just say this to give people a little bit of hope and, and confidence that they, they probably don't need to come to the clinic, but again, happy to see them if they need the help. Um, we've seen you know a, a surprising number of people who've been to three or four conventional doctors, been to three or four alternative doctors, and then they read the book and they were actually able to improve their health. And, and I think it's because we're not making the same mistakes that are endemic in the field, meaning kind of a paint by numbers approach of treating lab work, which is, again, it's, it's a, I, I, I don't like to use such pointed criticisms, but it's getting so bad in the field that I feel like I need to now so that, you know, both patients and providers are more aware of this and they can start pushing back on some of the lab and supplements, you know, company sponsored educational weekend seminars and such and demanding, you know, a better scientific basis for the training that's being put out there. Cause right now, unfortunately, a lot of it is lab led and it's just one quick tangent example, but it's, it's fairly poignant. Uh, there was a, a lab, well, you know, you biome was, was a lab that was all the rage I had been warning against Ubiome for years, the stool testing company saying that the, the science there was premature and preclinical. Well, they went bankrupt. They had an FBI investigation brought against them and they were found to have partially used dog poop to set the normative ranges for their stool testing values for humans. No way. Uh, so, so, you know, when someone says, well, I've been to three or four doctors. Well, if the three or four doctors are using a test like that and treating those test results and you haven't gotten better, there's nothing wrong with you. Right. And I think it's really important that people understand that because sometimes they'll come in and they'll say, well, I'm a, I'm a complicated chronic case. No, you're not. I mean, sure. There are some cases that are, but for many, no, you're not. It's not that bad. You just need the right approach to fix this. And unfortunately, I think doctors trying to help people they haven't had their filters on high enough of a level of scrutiny and they've accepted that, you know, the information from some of these companies, not understanding how fallacious some of those claims were. Oh, that's interesting. Very important. Not to mention like there's no, it's not necessarily exact science that even if you have a blood value that that's causing the symptom that you think it is. Yep, so exactly. It's a, it's a slippery slope, basically, Very you know, slippery. If, you're, if you're chasing those <laughs> blood values. Um, and it's great. The, the message you say to the, you know, you're telling people you're not, you're not that bad off, like no matter where you are. And the cool thing about the gut, it seems like it can heal pretty health pretty quick. So, yeah. or it yeah. can at least make progress quickly. So, you know, it might not get hundred percent in a couple of weeks, but no matter how bad you are, it seems like within a couple of weeks, you can make significant uh, meaningful yeah. progress. And that's an important message. It's, it's, you know, the body just knows the body knows how to heal. We just have to find what support it needs, take away, you know, common insults and just let it do its thing and get it out of its way and let it heal. So um, I know you're short on time. I want to respect your time and, and thank you for 
take the time. Is there anything else you want to add for people before I let you go? Uh, I mean, just to kind of recap some of the important concepts is that with the right approach, it's not hard to heal. Uh, you know, unfortunately, th there's a lot of good intentions combined with bad execution in the field. And it's one of the things that we're really trying to champion and reform and correct. And, and the only reason why I levy that criticism is just, again, so people that aren't feeling well and struggling understand that oftentimes it's not as hard to heal and improve as you think it is if you have the right approach. Healthy Gut, Healthy You lays out a detailed self-help action plan if people need help there. Uh, there's more information at drrusho.com, D-R-R-U-S-C-I-O.com, and also at austinfm.com. And yeah, just really appreciative of, of your kind words and, and the ability to uh, share some of my thoughts with your audience. Yeah, uh, my pleasure. And for the listeners out there, we'll link to all those uh, sites that Dr. Ruscio just mentioned into the show notes. Uh, for the listeners out there, I want to thank you for tuning in. I hope you got some value out of it. And if you think you know someone that isn't feeling as good as they'd like to and they want to play a bigger role themselves in getting better, please share this episode with them. Uh, Dr. Ruscio, thanks again for all the work you do. I really am grateful. I really look forward to one day meeting you in person, coming down to the clinic and checking it out um, when, you know, maybe on, on the other end of this weird situation we're in now. But it is really a pleasure just to, to see you like this. I've been listening to you for years. I really appreciate it. It's helped me personally. It's helped my clients. So I thank you for it. And um, but thanks again for tuning in, everybody. And I hope you all uh, check us out for upcoming episodes soon. Have a great day. Well, once again, thank you listeners for tuning in and listening to that conversation. I hope you got some value out of it. And of course, if you know someone else that you think would get value out of that, please share it. If you haven't subscribed to our channel yet, please do. And if there's any topics you'd like covered or any people in particular you'd like to hear on the show, then let me know and I'll do what I can. Uh, if you haven't yet put a review out for our, our podcast, I really appreciate you doing that. Um, it means a lot. And once again, I thank you. I'm very grateful for your listening today. And I hope you stick around for more coming soon.